to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Peace I leave with you, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. Know that peace this morning, and share it with those who are around you at home. The peace of the Lord be with you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and breathe on us. Bind our wounds and caress our hearts. Make us alive to your word and your presence. Amen. In some ways, it is overwhelming to think about the future of the church as we have known it. We have laid such high stakes on our buildings and structures, our rituals and routines. Who would have ever imagined the possibility of worship being meaningful without sitting in our favorite pews? are doing the things the way they have always been. We are creatures of habit, are we not? We feel safer with routines that are familiar even when they are not so good or have passed their prime. Here we are weeks now into a brand new thing that is likely to go on for a very long time and evolving. And it's not just us, but people all over the world from every tradition and every faith are none at all. Still, there is something fascinating about this hour for me as it relates to the church, capital C. It has caused many of us to think again about what we do and why, and of course how. We ask ourselves, what are the essential elements necessary in order to invoke or rather celebrate the presence of God in our midst, wherever we are, two or three or one, all by ourselves? I don't mind telling you that while it has been, for the most part, Isaiah, Derek, and I, 
along with Lisa and Marcus, those Sundays, there has been a palpable presence of the holy each week. And I am guessing that you have felt it, some of it, too, wherever you are. As we have made ourselves ready, our hearts have been pried open in the stillness of this time that has rendered us vulnerable in so many ways. And therefore, we have made room for God to break in on us, perhaps in ways that have not happened for a very long time through tears and laughter and sharing and our common struggle, our hearts have been made ready to receive. And alas, we have confirmed that our real work is about people. A few years ago, someone came up with the slogan, Rethink Church. It's hard to imagine what they had in mind, but I'm guessing it was nothing like what we're doing right now. Over these weeks, so many of our members and friends have expressed the joy of worshiping with a mother or father, a sister or brother, a friend for the first time in years. We are hearing the same messages and praying the same prayers and finding new connections with one another, and I'm glad about that at the end of the day. We are discovering what really matters and what really matters, really are the people in our lives and world. We must ask ourselves in this moment, what does a healthy church look like? The hungry look for food that nourishes the soul and spirit as well as the body. The tired and weary look for to lay down their burdens and catch fresh glimmers of hope through word or song. The fearful listen for prayers that might connect their anxiety to a measure of hope. And the curious stop by, just in case. How do we forge ahead and uplift the essential messages of God's inclusion for all people? We ask ourselves whether we have a little bit of faith, just enough to walk that lonesome valley enough to declare on the saddest day that the Lord is our shepherd. Because God is our shepherd, God is leading us and guiding us. We can trust somehow that God's way, God's penetrating love through the hearts and minds of other people and our own, God will provide. Did you notice that when Isaiah led us in the call to worship that old staple of the church, we took some liberties this morning with the scripture and said the Lord is our shepherd, your shepherd and mine. The shepherd of the sick and the afflicted, the shepherd of they who mourn, of the hungry and marginalized. The Lord is our shepherd. Those who weep this morning, those who are unsure of the way forward. This same one God is all of our shepherd. And because we are all in this together, we cannot and we must not think of ourselves in the singular anymore. None of us should want. The Lord is our shepherd and it is the Lord's desire that we should all rest by quiet streams and lay down in green pastures. Our New Testament lesson gives us a glimpse of what that early church was like. Many scholars labeled the book of Acts as the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We need to pick up on this because in just a few weeks we're going to be celebrating Pentecost. Now we need Pentecost this year especially. We need to understand and grab hold of that charismatic, unimaginable wind and fire of God breathing in on us and igniting not only our soul, but our hopes, our minds, our hands, our feet, and our spirit. We need to grab hold of Pentecost because it reminds us that there is power beyond ourselves. There is motivation behind us and there's a willingness to hang on and try again. 
It was amid so much doubt and confusion, bewilderment and hopelessness after the resurrection. Their leader was dead and the movement appeared dead as well. It looks like a mess of the highest sort. But if we read and listen carefully, we discover some clues that remind us that it is never over until God says it's over. It is never a complete mess when God is involved. This is our hope, is it not? This is why we cling to the church so much. The word church was barely used in the New Testament. A more accurate reference is the Greek word ecclesia, which means the called out ones. It describes the people, not the building. In early translations, the ecclesia meant the assembly, the congregation of believers, the gathered ones, those who have set themselves apart to be God's presence and God's light in the world, called together as the actual body, the very body of Christ. We come to the building for the sole purpose of being edified and built up, comforted and strengthened. But we are reminded that we don't necessarily need the building in order to be refreshed and pushed out into the world for our real work day by day. Despite their circumstance, Luke tells us that the church was filled with the sense of awe and wonder. After the crucifixion and that dark moment in the midst of death and seeming defeat, the people, the ecclesia, were filled with awe and wonder. And I hope we won't miss the moments of awe and wonder before us right now. Over these past weeks, I have heard story after story of how people are rising up how love is rising up in new and unexpected ways. Neighbor to neighbor, friend to stranger, generosity, kindness, thoughtfulness, patience, reaching out, checking in, going an extra mile, all bound up together by a common reality. And I hope it never ends. I, I hope it never stops. We must not let it stop. The world needs these hope-filled signs of humanity at her best. We need the Holy Spirit alive in every age. We need the Holy Spirit in the hearts and minds of people, not brick and mortar, spirit of truth and action and caring not of quiet passivity, a spirit that transforms people into the very image and essence of God. And oh my, it is so possible. And this moment is so ripe. Those early gatherers, the ecclesia, cared about one another and their shared mission and purpose. They were on one accord. A new standard of economic empowerment was ushered in as these believers sacrificed and tended to one another. The, richly glad, the rich gladly shared with the needy. They had all things in common. Did they all agree on everything? I can hardly imagine, but nevertheless, their shared work and common purpose created a foundation that attracted people day by day because Luke tells us that people were added to the church day by day. Can you imagine, my friends, what it would be like if all of our gifts and ideas were blended together for the common good, each person doing their part? Some have money or more money than others. Some have time or more time than others. Some have talents and creative ideas and experiences. Some have goodwill and a positive attitude, but all 
give and all benefit. And none feels more entitled than the other. This give and take of shared life would turn the world upside down. And that is what it means to be the church. And make no mistake about it, we all have something. If we have breath, we have something to add. And maybe this is just the right time to do an assessment, an analysis of what we truly bring to the table. We can give a clean slate to someone who needs forgiveness. We can offer the gift of acceptance, the freedom to be who someone is, not trying to change a thing. We can give a laugh or smile, or thank you here or there. A little patience while folk get themselves together. We can give an empathic ear where we place ourselves in someone else's shoes, assuming that they have shoes. And if they do not, we can go to our closet and give a pair away can give a heart of understanding because right now such things have great value. I tell you I have appreciated every time someone has asked, Kathy, how are you doing? And stuck around long enough to hear the response without judgment. It has helped me. Do you need anything or even better, anticipated a need, thought about it and acted on it ahead of time? We are all in this together is more than a slogan. It's more than a slogan. It is church talk and God talk. Everybody is in it and everybody is somebody. For we all bleed blood. All tears are the same, all of us yearn for love, received and given. We yearn for acceptance and freedom and at least a small piece of the pie. And we're all worthy. And this kind of thing is not without cost. It does not come free or cheap. It is radical and revolutionary. It goes against the grain, but oh, how sweet. How sweet and wonderful and life-giving how hopeful and extraordinary. And oh my, oh my, oh my, it is so possible. It is so possible for all of us. Thanks be to God.
So my friends, enlivened by the hope of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and for all of God's creation. I will end each petition with, hear us, O God, and invite you to respond, your mercy is great. Holy, compassionate God, our Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life for the sake of all people. In your eyes, there are none greater than the other. Lead us to put aside our own lives to the extent that your life might abound in us and others. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You are the good shepherd who takes care of the sheep. You are the bread of life that provides sustenance, the true vine that knits us together. We're grateful to be part of your fold. Lead us and guide us, and we shall be satisfied. Make us one with you and one with one another. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You humble the proud and lift up the lowly. Give your wisdom and humility to all who are in authority. Teach them how to care for even the least among us. For even the least belong to you, as well as the great. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. I pray for those today who are weighed down by grief and loss. And we give thanks for the gift of good love that makes the heart ache when the person is no longer with us, knowing that it is better to have loved and been loved than not at all. I pray for those who are worn down and tired those in emotional, mental, and spiritual distress, sick and tired of being sick and tired. May we, your church, be a source of strength and encouragement in these days, especially in these days. We pray for you, Jeannie, and Dee, and Cindy, and those we hold in our heart right now. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your resurrection creates new life and new ways to live. We pray that you will open new opportunities for us to be in cooperation and collaboration with one another. Bless your church. Bless your church. Bless your people. Your people. Forgive us of our sins. And give us a new beginning, a new way of moving forward. So that we might do our very best and that whatever that best is on any given day will be enough. That you will look at our hearts and our intentions as well as our actions. And that you will give us strength to do better. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We give you thanks for the saints all over the world. And those who have gone before us, mothers and fathers, Sisters and brothers, teachers, ministers, those who have shown us the way and those who have prayed for us even when we were not able to pray for ourselves, when we didn't even have the common sense to know that we needed a God in our lives. We thank you for their resilient faith and that they never let us go as you have never let us go. We pray that we will be better stewards of our time the opportunities laid before us. 
Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Indeed, your mercy is great. It is abundant. It is extraordinary. It, it covers a multitude of weaknesses and sins. And we thank you for it. For love so deep. Mercy so rich. And grace that helps us to see opens our ears and our eyes. We thank you for that in Jesus Christ who died for us all. Remind us that we're one family, one people, that you are God of us all. We pray this morning our family prayer. We say our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, give us our daily bread and forgive us, all of us, our trespasses as we forgive. As we Forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, all of us, from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. in Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide world. Can you even imagine, can you even imagine if we embrace this truth, go forth into this day and into this week and remember that we are bound together, bound together in love. And may the peace of Christ attend you in all that you do.